Thank you very much. That is very generous of you. Um, so I hope that um, my talk builds on the content of the, the previous speakers. Um, I'm really going to talk about um, how the, the, the physical design of the MRI facility really begins to shape uh, best practice, begins to shape what is possible in terms of delivery of care. Um, and the analogy that I like to use is your operations, your clinical uh, procedures um, are, they're the software and the, the building of the, the hospital, the bricks and mortar um, are the, the hardware um, that the software runs on. Um, now, if we take that metaphor to its logical extreme, um, we can't use just any set of hardware with any set of software. They have to be designed to work in concert. Um, and so my goal is not to turn every one of you into MRI facility architects. Um, my goal is when you have a capital project um, that I want you to think about these aspects of facility design, again, not because I'm trying to turn you into architects, but because um, I want you to recognize that decisions that are made in the design process will have direct implications uh, for what is possible um, in terms of clinical operations, in terms of safety um, over the life of that MRI and MRI facility. Um, so uh, just a few things about me before I jump into the content. Um, as mentioned, I am trained as an architect. Um, I became very interested in MRI as a technology in um, 1997, my first um, MRI design project. Um, and then very shortly thereafter, I became very interested in the safety aspects of the, the, the bricks and mortar, the suite. Um, um, and then that became sort of what has been the last 20 years, um, a, a deep and abiding interest in MRI safety. And it, it has transformed from just the architectural piece into operations, into clinical application, into physics, um, such that I am one of the founding board members of the American Board of Magnetic Resonance Safety, the ABMRS. Um, and I was fortunate enough to serve as the ABMRS chair for a couple of years. I have served um, the ACR, the American College of Radiology, um, two different times on their um, MRI safety committee. I'm one of the contributing authors to the 2007 ACR guidance document and the more recent 2020 manual on MR safety. Um, I also founded my own consultancy, Gilk Radiology Consultants, um, and with and through Gilk Radiology Consultants, I consult with Metrisense. Um, because I am a board member of the ABMRS, I offer this content disclosure um, whenever I speak on MRI safety related topics. Um, through the ABMRS, because the ABMRS administers the certification exams for MR medical director, MR safety officer, MR safety expert, um, as you can imagine, um, I'm precluded from talking about exam specific content. Um, however, I'm encouraged to continue to teach about general MRI safety concepts and principles, um, which is what we'll be discussing today. So we're really going to move quickly uh, through these five general points. Um, changes in MRI safety writ large. Um, the planning info that you will get from GE, Siemens, Philips, United, um, the vendors of the MRI equipment. Um, what that does include and what it doesn't include. I'm going to give a few pieces of advice, uh, considerations before you become, begin actively designing what your MRI suite will look like. Um, then I'll give you a few pieces of advice with respect to specifically designing the MRI suite, uh, things to contemplate. Um, and because this talk is, is primarily focused on safety, we will emphasize those safety elements. 
And then at the end, I'm going to give you a number of different resources uh, that are available to you um, that you may find helpful um, if and when you find uh, find yourself in a situation where you're getting new MRI equipment, where you have capital dollars to renovate or, or modify um, MRI facilities. So first, changes with respect to MRI safety. Um, MRI as, as a clinical tool, it was really established and its intent at its, at its birth um, was as a low acuity diagnostic only modality. Um, the last 20 years in particular, we have seen dramatic expansions in MRI capabilities and in terms of the patients that it's able to see, uh, technically what the MRI is capable of doing uh, um, just based on, on the equipment itself. And each of those changes come with commensurate risks uh, that have grown and changed. If we plot, and this data on the chart that you're seeing here is just from, from the US, um, but if we plot changes in um, MRI procedure growth, which is the blue line, um, using the year 2000 as, as a baseline and just looking at percentage change from the year 2000, um, there's been a fairly consistent and steady upward march uh, of MRI procedure volume, the blue line, um, up until last year, uh, COVID negatively impact uh, ne negatively impacted imaging volumes across the board. Um, um, MRI, one of the most significantly impacted. Um, but if we look at the rate of MRI accidents, technically these are the ones that are classified under the MRI device product code with the US FDA. The red line shows a growth of more than two times the rate of growth in terms of um, volume increase. If we were doing an equal job in terms of preventing MRI accidents and injuries, we would expect the red line to more or less overlap the blue line. Um, if we were improving MRI safety over time, we would expect the red line to go below the blue line. The fact that the red line, the accident line is above and consistently above the blue line indicates that over time, uh, we are allowing a greater and greater number of MRI accidents and injuries to occur in given any number of, of um, MRI procedures that are performed. So when it comes to replicating models of MRI safety or um, the topic of this talk, it, replicating models of facility design and construction, um, it's important to acknowledge that the way we have done things historically um, has been insufficient in, to keep accidents and injuries uh, under control. Uh, we are growing accidents and injuries, both in terms of raw numbers and in terms of the proportion of total number of MRI studies that produce accidents and injuries. Um, and neither of those are statistics that any of us should be comfortable with. So what, um, what are some of the changes in clinical application of MRI? Um, it used to be there were bold print disclaimers from the MRI manufacturers that we, under no circumstance are you to image a patient in whom there's an implanted device, a foreign body. Um, those disclaimers or prohibitions have been removed uh, from MRI um, operators' manuals. Um, nowadays, we see MRI being increasingly used uh, for emergent and trauma cases, uh, stroke assessments, cord compressions. Um, those types of studies just quite simply were not done uh, 20 years ago or 30 years ago. Um, and so again, the, the whole notion of patient acuity or the level of patient intervention, um, image guided biopsies um, didn't practically exist uh, 20 years ago, um, but, but now we're doing MR guided interventions, MR guided biopsies. Um, so the level of intervention in patient care is changing as well. Functions MRI providers need. Um, 
So when we are anticipating an MRI facility, um, it's not just about the MRI scanner itself. Um, we need to anticipate that we are going to receive the patients and whoever the patient comes with, their family members. We're going to need to receive them and do the, the, the paperwork, um, the bookkeeping that needs doing before the study uh, proceeds. Uh, at some point, we're going to need to perform a clinical screening of the patient, check their medical history, check them for implants and devices and foreign bodies. Uh, we will need to do a physical screening of the patient, uh, separating the patient from their belongings, securing their belongings, uh, gowning the, the patient into um, hospital or imaging center provided uh, uh, clothing so that the patient is not wearing their own clothing into the MRI whenever possible. Um, if the patient comes with a wheelchair or a portable oxygen cylinder, uh, we need to safely secure those patient brought belongings. Um, and in many cases, we need to provide them with MRI safe or MR conditional versions of the wheelchair, the walker, the cane, the portable oxygen cylinder. Um, if the patient is um, undergoing an exam that we anticipate the need of contrast, uh, we may be doing a, a, a catheterization, IV cath, um, preparing them to receive um, the IV contrast. If we're doing sedation um, or, or sedation and general anesthesia, we need to think about spaces necessary to induce and recover that patient from the anesthetic. So when we think about an MRI capital project, it's, it's only natural that our minds leap to the piece of equipment, um, but it's very important that we think through the entire patient experience, the workflow from arrival to discharge um, and anticipate all of the spaces that are necessary um, to really support each of those functions because an MRI capital project that is only about the equipment is, I won't say destined to fail, but it is destined to not live up to its potential if we don't think through the, the, the integration of the hardware and the software. So what planning information do we get from our equipment vendors? Um, typically, they only give us site planning information for the rooms in which their equipment sits. So typically, this means the, the scanner room itself, um, which would be zone four. Um, control room, where the operator, the technologist radiographer sits, um, and the system component or the equipment room. Um, and those are really the only three elements of the, an MRI facility design that we will get from the equipment vendor. Um, this is an illustration. This is a, a, a prototypical floor plan from, uh, this one is from GE. I, I, I don't mean to pick on GE in particular. Um, every one of the manufacturers has some different version of this um, that depicts the um, control room, uh, operator's console, radiographer's console, um, the scanner room, and then the system component room. Uh, this particular layout, um, I suspect that GE over time um, was just able to sh shrink their equipment room um, and they repurposed previous um, prototypes. Um, and so they just squeezed in um, a reading station um, into the, the leftover space. Um, but that's actually fairly atypical um, in terms of what we're accustomed to seeing. Um, but this is what you get um, from your OEMs. Um, notice how the, the functions and features and workflow elements that I described earlier, um, there's no provision for any of those in this diagram. Um, and so if you approach a capital project using only the information from your equipment vendor, um, you're likely to leave out some very important physical spaces that support the appropriate function. Um, so again, 
looking at the, the vendor plan. There's no place to receive uh, patients. There's no place to interview patients, no dressing rooms, no belonging storage, no contrast uh, preparation or IV start, nothing that suggests support for anesthesia care um, or inpatient care for that matter, non-ambulatory patient care. So that first piece is really sort of an admonition that we need to, um, absolutely, we need to work with our OEMs and, and, and take the information that they provide us. But the admonition is do not um, receive that information from the OEM as if that is all you need to proceed with uh, an MRI project. Um, before you actively begin designing the project, um, there are several questions that you should ask and answer for yourself related to the project. Um, what level of patient acuity um, do we anticipate this MRI facility to support? Um, and that each of these questions should be asked not just of the moment today, but if we anticipate that these MRI facilities are destined for a 10 year, 15 year, 20 year lifespan, uh, we need to do a little bit of fortune telling, uh, predicting the future and anticipating what changes we think are likely um, over the horizon. Um, so what level of patient acuity, uh, what level of patient sedation or general anesthesia might we support uh, in this MRI service? What level of interventional care? Um, uh, that could be image-guided biopsies, image-guided therapy. Um, what allied clinical services will come to MRI in, in patient care, patient support roles? Um, anesthesia, um, we talked about levels of sedation and anesthesia and the spaces uh, required for that. But beyond anesthesia team, what about respiratory or nursing? Or if you're doing cardiac devices, maybe it's just a, a vendor rep from you know, the, the pacemaker uh, company who's coming to do programming or deprogramming of a pacemaker device. Um, what, what other clinical or vendor or support personnel will be coming to MRI um, to, to further your patient care? Um, and what did they require in terms of space or provisions within the MRI suite? Um, and whatever you map for yourself in terms of your contemporary need, how is that likely to change over time? And what can you anticipate today to, if not spend additional money, um, at least allow yourself future flexibility so that those changes are less costly, less disruptive. So one of the, the main elements when I said uh, acuity, um, this table, actually the, the table is taken from uh, the VA um, design guide, which um, at the very end, if you wanna grab out your mobile phones, when we get to the end, when we get to resources, I'm gonna share with you a number of resources that will have URLs, web links, um, and you may want those. I will also ask Ms. Feta um, to, to share this uh, presentation um, with anybody who needs it. Um, but when I talk about level of acuity, the FGI, Facilities Guidelines Institute, in their 2018 uh, design criteria, um, FGI is, is a design criteria for the whole hospital. Um, um, and I helped them rewrite their radiology and nuclear medicine sections um, for the 2018 edition. In that edition, um, we defined different levels of acuity and, and there are different site requirements, construction requirements based on the level of acuity. Um, this may sound novel, but it's actually based on the way we characterize other spaces within the hospital. Uh, we have exam rooms, we have procedure rooms, we have operating rooms. Um, those three room types really um, are, are fairly common 
in understanding, um, but in radiology, because, well, we used to call it diagnostic imaging. So there was always this presumption that the most intensive it ever could be would be diagnosis, exam. Um, that has changed fairly dramatically. So we have the imaging classification system, class one, diagnostic, class two, interventional, class three, intraoperative surgical hybrid OR. Um, so the class that a room or, or a facility is given is based on uh, three different factors. The level of patient acuity, how much clinical support that patient is gonna need, the level of sedation or anesthesia, um, and how much, what may be necessary in terms of life support for a, a patient on anesthesia, um, and then level of direct intervention concurrent with imaging. Um, and depending on what the, the most severe, uh, the most involved uh, elements are, you define the imaging classification for that facility um, and the design criteria change accordingly. Um, this is from the, uh, the VA space planning um, criteria. Um, this is another wonderful resource. And again, uh, the URL for this resource will be at the end, um, but it essentially walks you through an effort to identify every function, every space, every square meter um, that is associated with um, an operational model for, well, this is for all of imaging. So this has CT, this has fluoro, this has X-ray, it has MRI. Um, and it will essentially help you identify um, staffing functions, uh, individual spaces. The space allocations um, are pretty generous. Um, and in your facility, you may need to sort of pare back some of the space allocations or even take two sort of associated functions that are just described in the space planning criteria as separate facilities, separate rooms you may elect to, to join them together um, for greater space efficiency. Um, if you choose to adapt or modify the information in the space planning criteria, by all means, please do. Um, but please use this as, as a resource for thinking through the workflow, the, the functions of the space. Um, and again, anticipate how today's use may change over time um, because MRI facilities are both expensive, um, difficult to work in. Um, and I guess a third thing, um, MRI is, is critical patient care today. Um, it, is, it is a vital diagnostic tool in, in our ability to treat patients. So not only is it expensive and complicated to um, take an MRI down to make renovations to it, um, but there is a, there's a third cost just in terms of the interruption to patient care. When you are actively involved in a capital project that um, includes the design of a new MRI facility, <coughs> excuse me, um, there are a number of things, and again, we're focusing specifically on safety. Um, there are a million and one additional concern, concerns or considerations that are not specifically safety related. Um, but for the safety issues, um, access restrictions and zoning, um, supporting spaces and their functions, ferromagnetic detection and cryogen or quench pipe. Um, well, previous speakers have spoken about the, the four zone model. Um, this diagram is from the, the VA um, Imaging Services Design Guide, and it maps um, traditional ways of, of defining zones um, onto sort of a, a flowchart sequence of spaces as you move through them. Um, I find this um, helpful. Um, let me show you, this is an alternative sort of zone diagram. Um, that, that I developed, the, the challenge is that the zones are really related to risk factors um, and not so much the defined rooms. The one exception to that being zone four 
is defined as the magnet room. Um, but the other zones are really um, defined by uh, relative risk related to MRI function. Um, and so zone three is a space outside of the magnet room where there may be MRI specific physical risks um, and or um, there is direct access from that space into the MRI scanner room. If either of those two conditions are met or both, um, then that's a zone three space. Uh, zone two spaces are essentially anterooms or preparatory spaces before we get into the realm of hazard. Zone two is where we do our patient investigation, patient preparation. Um, and then zone one is, well, you and I are, are sitting in zone one for every MRI on the planet. Zone one is an area with no MRI function, no MRI hazard. Um, so ultimately it's zones two, three, and four um, that become the, the most critical elements in terms of, of layout from a safety uh, screening and access control standpoint. Those are the elements that, that really go into the design in terms of restricting access. Support spaces. Um, now you may be asking, wait a minute, you, you're showing patient dressing rooms and patient personal property lockers uh, and, and the sub waiting area. Those don't seem specific to MRI safety. Um, they are in the terms that a lot of MRI safety is either accomplished or failed um, before the patient enters zone three. Um, we really want to make sure that we have an opportunity to have a thorough clinical screening of the patient. We wanna make sure that we can get the patient to um, remove, divest themselves of anything that might represent a, a hazard, a risk inside the, the MRI zone three, zone four environment. Um, so the, the screening and the preparation piece of this is directly tied to the safety of, of the patient inside MRI area. Um, and so we really need to put a great deal of emphasis on those preparatory spaces. Uh, to make sure that, that we're doing all of the things that are necessary for patient preparation um, to reduce those risks before the patient walks into the controlled access point. Um, one of those elements is the incorporation of ferromagnetic detection. Um, uh, previous speakers have uh, given you much more information about its function and its placement. One thing that I'll share with you, this is from the VA design guide, um, is a recommendation for a thickened wall um, at the MRI room entrance. Um, this helps um, improve the performance of ferromagnetic detection by removing it slightly from the position of the, the swinging uh, radio frequency door um, and reduces the um, the ferromagnetic detection systems detecting of any ferromagnetic material in the door, in a moving door, um, allows you to increase the, the sensitivity setting for the ferromagnetic detection. Um, the doors themselves, um, there has been a lot of information spread based on historical practices that's probably not accurate any longer. Um, I was one of the most vocal advocates for outward swinging doors for MRI 20 years ago. Um, that was when um, the building codes and standards, at least in the US and North America, um, allowed for non-latching doors. Um, today, almost all radio frequency doors that I see are latching, positively latching doors, um, which means they're not going to open on their own if the room becomes pressurized. The latch will prevent that from happening. So if the outward swinging door, if the benefit really was predicated on um, there being no latch, as soon as we put a latch on the door, then the outward swing does provides us no real benefit. 
So the idea behind an outward swinging door safety is if there's a quench and if some of the cryogen leaks into the room and pressurizes the room, the theory was that an outward swinging door would be pushed open um, from the pressure building inside the room with a latch that just doesn't happen. Now, every uh, manufacturer of superconducting MRI systems, with the exception of the, there are some new ones from Philips that don't require any quench pipes whatsoever. But if you have a quench pipe, the recommendation from the vendor is that you also have a passive pressure relief system that allows the door to swing whatever direction works best for you. My personal preference is to swing the MRI room door into the MRI room. Um, that makes sighting the ferromagnetic detection system a little bit easier. Um, it also makes better use of space in the corner of the MRI room um, that really doesn't serve much other function uh, and allows you to be more generous with the usable space in the control area. Um, quench pipes, the cryogen exhaust. Um, on the screen, you see two different images of a quench pipe. Um, the one on the left is actually, it, it, it's similar to the, what has been the, or had been the standard detail from GE for their quench pipes for forever, for a very, very long time. Um, the illustration on the left is really there to show you that it doesn't take a whole lot of wind speed to push rain um, into a, a quench pipe. Uh, wind speeds of 25 miles per hour um, are, are sufficient to defeat the, the weather head protection. Um, if rain or precipitation or any material gets into the quench pipe, um, if the MRI system does quench, um, now you have a potential blockage in there. And I have seen magnets that have exploded um, or have had catastrophic failures um, when there has been a blockage in the quench pipe. The image on the right is uh, an illustration of um, a full and complete weather head. Um, now there are different full and complete weatherhead designs. And I'm not suggesting that this 180 degree candy cane um, top is the only way uh, to do it, but it is significantly better than the, the version on the left. Um, so I made mention of the VA design guide. In 2020, uh, last year, the, the VA released a new imaging services design guide. Um, and it covers all radiology and nuclear medicine modalities. Um, for MRI, um, like your OEM templates, the VA design guide template shows just the magnet room, the control room, um, and the system component room. Um, there will be two dimensional drawings like this, and there are three dimensional models like this. Um, in the VA design guide, there are also three-dimensional PDFs. These models are manipulatable. You can essentially do this. You can rotate them and view them from different perspectives. Um, uh, that's in the, the VA design guide. But while, while these are, are very sexy, um, these are very interesting to look at, um, it's not a more, it's, it's not a comprehensive view of the space. It really shows us the same elements that the OEM shows us in terms of rooms. Um, I have been working with Metrosense. Uh, we are so close to having this uh, for release. Um, um, my hope was that I would be able to point you to a specific resource by this lecture. Um, unfortunately, that hasn't happened as yet, um, but it will be available very soon in the next few weeks, I'm expecting. Um, and we have new uh, templates that are actually derived from the, the VA ones that include not just the magnet room, the equipment room, and the control room, but they actually use the, the VA's tool for assigning spaces. Um, and they show waiting rooms, changing rooms, IV start rooms, medication preparation rooms, uh, inpatient holding rooms. Um, and so these new suite diagrams, and they're the, the two, both two-dimensional and the three-dimensional 
um, rotatable views. Um, we hope to have those available in just in the next few weeks. Now, here's the point where I said I was going to give you a handful of different resources. Um, um, at the bottom is, is the URL, the web link uh, to gain access to this. Um, most of what I'm about to share with you are free resources. This one, however, is not. Um, the FGI, this is the design standard um, that is most commonly used in the United States. In the US, each of the 50 states get to decide on their own design standards for hospitals. Um, uh, but FGI is, is by far the most widely used in the United States. Um, it's also used internationally. Um, the 2018 edition, um, now I, I am biased because I was deeply involved in the, the radiology rewrite of this section, um, but I do believe that the 2018 FGI um, gives the most comprehensive and, and up-to-date design approach um, guidance for radiology and nuclear medicine, um, and most certainly for, for MRI. Um, this is the VA space planning criteria link um, and, and uh, screen capture from the table of contents. The space planning criteria essentially helps you identify um, based on the number of expected studies, based on the number of working hours per day, um, working days per year. Um, using these factors, it will say, well, based on that anticipated workload and those anticipated working hours, you really should have two MRIs or one or six or whatever that number may be. Essentially, it gives you the maths for uh, justification or validation of how much how much of a patient care resource you should have or ways in which you can modify operations um, to, to achieve the, the patient care goals that you have based on annualized numbers. Um, it also walks you through um, the individual spaces that are at least within the VA. Uh, VA is US Veterans Administration. Um, um, within the VA system, what spaces, functions, um, areas ought to be allocated. Um, this is the 2020 VA design guide. Um, this is the element that has, as you can see from the picture, um, design guidance, design standards for all of radiology and nuclear medicine. Um, including MRI. Um, and this is what has those design templates. Um, if nothing else, um, the, the two-dimensional templates that have the control room, the system component room, and the scanner room, um, those are actually designed and laid out with the intent that they are vendor neutral. Um, so it doesn't matter whether you're getting a GE or a Philips or a Toshiba or um, it doesn't matter whether you're getting a 1.5 Tesla or a 3 Tesla, the layouts and the, the designs are really um, meant to be vendor neutral and to the extent practical, magnet neutral. Um, obviously you can get you know, high field opens or, or unusual format magnets that may have different siting requirements. Um, but in general, the space allocations associated with it are really meant to accommodate worst case scenarios. Um, anybody who is interested, uh, this is free, but I can't give you sort of a, a, a link to get it. Uh, this was um, 2020 Clinics in MRI. Uh, did an entire issue on MRI safety. Um, I would encourage anybody who's interested in this topic uh, to, to find this copy of clinics. Um, it, is, it has a dozen or more brilliant papers in it. Um, it has one paper in it that I wrote, um, and I will leave it to you to decide whether you think it's brilliant or not. But if you would like a copy of the paper, MR Imaging Safety, Siting and Zoning Considerations, um, I invite you to send me an email. I can't distribute it um, you know, through a, a public web link, um, but if you send me an email and you request it, um, I'd be more than happy to, to provide you with a copy of the paper. 
The last thing that I'll offer as a, a reference or resource, um, uh, last year, last year was my um, my year of of um, supporting India in in MRI, and unfortunately, because of COVID, um, I haven't been able to come back as I wish to. I was at the IRA IRIA meeting uh, last year, January, um, and then also the the SIR conference um and that one we did remotely um there were recorded lectures for that the this is a recorded lecture um for the sir conference um on mri risk assessments and better understanding the spatial distribution of the magnetic field and the time varying gradients and the radio frequency energy um and i think it's about a one hour lecture um and if any of you are interested um there's the web link for that um the last one, again, I said um, very shortly, I expect the Metrosens, um, it's, we're calling it design and construction primer uh, for MRI suite uh, construction. Um, hopefully within the next few weeks, uh, there is a, a page on the Metrosens website um, that deals with um, architectural siting. Um, of the ferromagnetic detection equipment. My expectation is that this new document will be um, in that same location. Um, but again, uh, if, if you have any questions about it, please send me an email. I'd be more than happy to respond to you or let you know uh, when it's available. Thank you so much for your time, for your attention. Um, if you wish to get in touch with me, um, here are a number of different ways that you can do that. Uh, my email address, um, the website for my consultancy, the website for the architectural firm that does radiology, MRI facility design. Um, uh, if you are interested in more communications, more conversations about MRI safety, there is a Facebook group um, with more than 25,000 members worldwide. Um, I invite you to participate in that. Um, and you can also find me and lots of MRI safety information from my um, Twitter posts, um, the last one there. And with that, thank you so much. I appreciate the invitation. I appreciate the opportunity to share this with you. Thank you. Thank you. That was 